Amen? And it might be hot outside, but it's not hot inside. I'll try and uh, moderate how much I say something, so I won't add to the hot air. But, uh, it's, you know, we've got a visitor today all the way from the continent of Australia. And they've, they've made a very specific trip to come here and be with us. So without any further ado, I'm going to ask my visitor to come on up. <laughs> Pictures 
and he'll be more than happy to show you his pictures. <laughs> so during greeting, you can go over and he'll, he's got the pictures and you'll enjoy them. Cute as a butt, little girl. So congratulations to Bill and Carol and the family. Let's All right, more good news. If you've watched and been aware of, our Supreme Court ruled on Friday that the abortion law that the Supreme Court decided 50 years ago is no longer good. That's a good news, right? Yes. Praise God for that. That's good news. And the vote was not five to four, it was six to three. So that's very positive. And I love what they said concerning the previous ruling should never have happened. Exactly what they said. So praise God, it's only taken about 50 years to get to this point, but it's a good time. Um, the other thing that I would say is much prayer is needed because now you have what I would describe as a domestic terrorist activity that's aiming its target is the crisis pregnancy centers. They have vowed to do everything they can to disrupt these centers and to cause harm. So the folks that work in these pregnancy crisis centers are surely got a target on their back besides the places where they have set up to serve others. So we need to really pray in those situations for what they're going to experience as far as these threats go. And then uh, let's see more information concerning right here, um, the back stoop coming out of the building has been replaced. And so it looks very good. The other one was getting very dilapidated and just wasn't safe. So that's been replaced, which is good. Um, secondly, our handicap ramp in the last two weeks started to have an issue. And this week it was repaired. So it's good and sturdy and all taken care of. And so we praise God, nobody got injured in the time that it happened. It was one of those things again where uh, through the winter, everything was fine. And then all of a sudden something kind of went amiss, but that's been repaired. Next, um, the man that oversees the resurfacing of our parking lot called me on Thursday to let me know that they will be coming on Tuesday to redo the parking lot. So it's been three years since we had it done. So they're coming to do it on Tuesday. So it'll be resurfaced and it will look much better when you show up next Sunday. And so that's happening on Tuesday. The next bit of update news, and that is that the other sample Bible for looking at to put in the pews is on its way. I got word it's on its way. I should have it by Wednesday. It should be there. And so I'll have it out for display next Sunday. And probably what I'm going to do is put out slips of paper and have you decide on which one you like best and you'll write it on the slip of paper which one you like best and there'll be a basket for you to drop that in. And then depending on what the majority decides is the choice we'll make. Okay, so that's, that's coming up next week. And then one more thing, I want you to mark your calendar so that you don't overlook this, but we have our church picnic planned for July 31st. That's the last day of July, and it falls on a Sunday. And the reason we did that is because Star Park in Leicester, that's where we're going, didn't have any Saturdays open. So I said, well, I'll take a Sunday then. So it'll be the last Sunday in July, July 31st, and so we'll be doing a picnic after the service. And so that will require you, like I say, put it on your calendar because I want you all to be there. And we'll have a, a very enjoyable time together 
in the afternoon. And we'll be ready to eat. So everything will be ready to go. So that's on July 31st. I'm sorry, Pastor. Where did you say it was? Uh, it's going to be at Star Park, which is in Leicester. Okay? Thank you. That will be coming up in July 31st. What time is it going to be? What time? Right after service? Or you it's going to be, well, everybody will probably have to change. I'll have to change and everything. So the service will probably get out at 11, and we'll probably aim for about 12.30, like about 12.30. So that will hopefully give you enough time to transition and then bring whatever you're going to bring, dish to pass and things. And so we'll be all set. Does that sound good? It'll be like about 12.30. Okay. All right. I don't think there's anything else except uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful and grateful for this opportunity to be together. We're, we're praising you for good news. Lord, we think about the birth of this uh, child into the lab family and what a great blessing that is to see children come into this world and so we give you thanks for the safe delivery of this child and we would pray now for the parents that you'll be with them as they adjust to uh, first time being first time parents and we pray your blessing on them as they begin this journey uh, with this precious blessing added into their lives then father we do rejoice over the supreme court ruling on friday and it's a great victory for life. And so we would pray right now that you will be with those that are in the crisis pregnancy centers, Lord, that as they're being targeted, we would pray for safety and protection for them. We would also ask, Father, that uh, these threats, you would begin to minimize, cause them to diminish and to uh, not be successful. And then, Father, we pray that you'll be with us in this service that will be strengthened in the faith. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I think the three ladies are going to come up, and we got three ladies that are going to sing. So they're going to come up, and whatever else you need, you need to know, you'll tell us, right? Okay?
preventing the crisis workers when the flood of evil is going to be coming. The tidal wave, battle is the Lord's. Praise God for that. So go ahead and open your Bibles to Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. We're going to do a little review of what we studied previously in this chapter, and then we will finish the chapter. We'll pick up where we left off part way through it and go to the end of the chapter. But we're going to start with Romans 14 and verse 1. And this is what we find written. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. So as we begin studying this chapter, we learn that conflicts among us as believers can easily erupt. Our differing levels of spiritual maturity and our differing personal convictions can easily cause these disputes. And the things we usually get into disputes about are doubtful in terms of clearly being right and wrong. It depends on our background in view of our experiences and our upbringing as to what conclusion we will make on these matters that are called gray issues. One of the biggest disputes we learned about of this former time revolved around and you kind of, kind of surprising, but revolved around food. A dispute about food. Look at verse 2. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. So we can easily define this standoff in our terms as meat lovers and vegetarians. And the meat in question has been used in sacrifice to idols. Now, churches throughout the Roman Empire were having conflicts on this topic everywhere. That's the truth. Now, listen to this excerpt from Paul's letter to those living in Corinth. Next is your question about eating food that has been sacrificed to idols. On this question, and, and I love how he writes this, on this question, everyone feels that only his answer is the right one. Does that sound familiar today? <laughs> only his answer is the right one. But although being a know-it-all makes us feel important, what is really needed to build the church is love. If anyone thinks he knows all the answers, he is just showing his ignorance. But the person who truly loves God is the one who is open to God's knowledge. So the challenge for all of us in Christ is what? To remain humble. Instead of giving in to what? Our pride. You see, proud people think they know everything. Uh, my wife would look at me and said, you're a good one to talk. Because I've been in that position quite often. They think their answer is the only right one. Right, dear? Yes. <laughs> but here's the point. Only the humble can love God. And remain ready to do as God instructs concerning any dispute, which is what? To act in love toward those they disagree with. You know, I, I, as I'm just thinking as the ideas are flying by, I usually will catch one as it flies by. And you know, as thinking about this, wouldn't it be grand if we were in a dispute with someone and it was starting, the attention was starting to raise and we just stopped what we were doing, looked right at them and said, you know what? And they'll probably, their eyes will be bulging out like, well, what? I love you. What might that do to that dispute? Yeah, I think it might lower the temperature, right? 
I love you. <clears throat> because I can see in you the glory of my King, Jesus Christ. Wow, that would be an, an interesting way to, to answer a dispute. So, what are the instructions we learned previously concerning this dispute? Well, look at verse 3. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. So there's some don'ts here that we are being told about. First of all, don't condemn those who differ from you in this dispute. Here's another don't. Don't accuse them of being less spiritual than you because they don't behave exactly like you do on this topic. <laughs> Those are two big don'ts. And then, here's the positive. God has accepted both of you into his kingdom. Are we wiser than God in refusing to accept one another? And I'd say, no, not by a long shot. I'm not wiser than God in saying, I don't accept you because you don't think like I do. No, that's not a good path to take. Well, look at verse 4. He says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up. For God is able to make him stand. So having the final say over one another in the sight of God is not our job in the faith. It's not our job. Well, whose job is it? It's God's job. All of us depend on God's judgment in discerning what? If we've taken a step in the right or in the wrong direction concerning any gray issue that's open to what? Interpretation. It's only what God thinks which should matter in any position we take involving these gray issues. And he will determine if we got it right or we got it wrong. And I would say this, he can certainly correct us if we're wrong, right? And he can do a pretty good job of it without our help, right? In these matters of the heart. Now, let's move down to verse 7 and 8. Here's a very interesting statement. For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. So, from what he said there, we're not free to do what? To act independently in God's kingdom. We all have a shared responsibility with one another. We all belong to the Lord to serve him ahead of ourselves. We aren't accepted into God's kingdom to do as we want apart from him and apart from his family. So this means what? It means this. We will have to learn to, number one, yield to others. Yield to others. Number two, we're going to have to learn to listen when we're spoken to. You know, and, and again, this isn't rocket science, is it? This is really basic courtesy. And third, we're going to have to learn to respond appropriately in these settings, right? Respond appropriately. These disputes involving doubts about right and wrong need to be approached with humble hearts and humble minds instead of what? A determination to get our way at all costs. Now that's some of the things that we've already learned. Just review. 
Let's now proceed with the remainder of this chapter, beginning with verse 14. Let's look at verse 14. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. Again, the topic for consideration is meat. Paul is confident that Jesus at some point declared all meat free of the ability to make us unclean spiritually. He's confident. And so we might ask, well, is this knowledge public for all to see? And he'd say, yes. Then the next question is, well, where can we find it? Let's go to Mark chapter 7. The Gospel of Mark chapter 7. We're going to start at the beginning of the chapter in verse 1 and read through verse 5. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Here's what we find written. Then came together unto him the Pharisees and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. We might say from headquarters. Okay. And when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say, with unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the market, and when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashing hands? These were unwritten rules, which implied how you ate, and what you ate could damage your soul. The unwritten rules. And Jesus is being chastised for the perceived failure of his students to heed the unwritten rules. How did he respond to this? Let's go to verse 14. Okay, getting right to the heart of the matter. From verse 14 through verse 23. And when he had called all the people unto him, he said unto them, Hearken unto me, every one of you, and understand. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things which come out of him, those are they that defile the man. If any man have ears to hear, let him hear. That was right to the point. But there's more. And when he was entered into the house from the people, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. And he said unto them, Are ye so without understanding also? Do ye not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it entereth not into his heart, but into the belly, and goeth out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. So according to Jesus, physical food can't damage our souls because it only enters our stomachs. It is our thoughts, it is our attitudes which damage our souls. These things make us evil rather than the food we eat. Now those with a strong faith 
know this, like Paul does, and feel free to partake of any food, including what was formerly used in the worship of idols. Now, even though this is true, there's an issue which the strong can't overlook. You might say, what is the issue? Okay, let's return back to Romans 14 from our little excursion into Mark. Romans 14 and back to verse 14. Now here is the fly in the ointment to speak of. Verse 14 he says, But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Some in the faith at this time don't see it the way the strong do. In their mind, this meat is tainted by any association with idols. It's tainted. That's it. How can this be? How can they have this attitude? How can they think this way? Well, listen to these comments made by Paul to those in Corinth to really give us clarity. He writes, so now, what about should we eat meat that has been sacrificed to idols? Well, we all know that an idol is not really a god. And there is only one god and no other. According to some people, there are a great many gods, both in heaven and on earth. But we know that there is only one God, the Father, who created all things and made us to be his own. And one Lord Jesus Christ, who made everything and gives us life. And we're all amen and amen. However, a great word to start, right? However. Some Christians don't realize this. All their lives, they have been used to thinking of idols as alive and have believed that food offered to the idols is really being offered to actual gods. So when they eat such food, it bothers them and hurts their tender consciences. Just remember, that God doesn't care whether we eat it or not. We are no worse off if we don't eat it and no better off if we do. So as we can see, the dispute seems to be due to differing levels of spiritual maturity and different upbringing. Those with a background in idolatry struggle with any association to that former life. Now, there are similar examples today of those in Christ which struggle with some issue in their past too, right? I mean, we can throw out the big ones. We can think of an alcoholic got saved, but that person might struggle with alcohol makes sense. We can definitely see a potential conflict over the meat which others can eat freely apart from any inhibitions about it. What do these brothers and sisters in Christ with differing convictions do as they sit down to eat together? Oh boy. It seems the burden of acting selflessly falls more heavily upon the shoulders of the strong, not the weak. That's very important. How? Look at verse 15. He says, But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. If they are sitting side by side at a table where meat used in association with idols is served, then that weaker person 
is going to be on edge at the sight of it. They're going to be, their skin's crawling and they're just perspiring and sweating because, oh. Now if the strong can just continue to eat this meat without any concern for the dilemma of the weak, Paul says, this proves they aren't acting in love towards the person beside them. What could happen to the weaker person? Very simply, a situation like this could ruin him. Could ruin him. Look again at verse 15. He gives this counsel. He says, destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. What is he saying here? The appetite for meat shouldn't take priority over the importance of what Christ accomplished in dying for that weaker one in the faith. I mean, is it wise to ruin others simply because you won't be denied what you want? Is it wise? We would say, I don't think it is. Look at verse 16. He says, let not then your good be evil spoken of. Now, the strong is not out of line for thinking this meat has no ability whatsoever to affect my soul. In fact, Paul says your thinking on this topic is good. It's good. But, oh, there's the word, but, but to be unloving in the expression of the truth can only lead to what? Criticism. Instead of appreciation for what you know. It's very important. I mean, remember this thought in Ephesians? Brothers and sisters, speak the truth in love. Uh, look at verse 17. He goes on to make another very important point. He says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God is not based on what we can get for ourselves in eating and drinking now that we're a part of the kingdom. You got that mentality? You're way off. Way out of bounds. You see, the kingdom is founded upon three important things here. Hey, listen. First of all, it's founded upon the righteousness of Christ being shared with each and every one of us. That's huge. Secondly, it's founded upon the peace we experience with God now. Meaning, at one point in our lives, before we came into the kingdom, we had no peace with God. But once we came into the kingdom, now we have peace with God. That's huge. And third, the joy we have comes from the Holy Spirit in our lives. Hear that? I mean, all parts of the Trinity are there. That's what we're founded upon. The experience we have with them. That's the foundation of the kingdom. Not this thing about, well, what I'm going to eat and what I'm going to drink. Look at verse 18. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. You know, it's quite clear if these three foundational truths are prevalent in our lives, then we will serve Christ's purpose concerning others instead of what? Selfishly demanding my own way. Remember, Paul wrote, love does not demand its own way way. If you don't give me what I want, then I'm out of here. And I'm going to let everybody know how mad I am. That's not love. If we love others 
in any type of dispute like this, then we can be certain God will be pleased. I mean, this type of loving conduct will certainly meet with what? The approval of others too. People will look on this and go, that's the way to solve a dispute. Hey, love each other. It's quite the opposite of this other example that I found in the scriptures. And it's a story that Jesus told, and I'm just going to condense it down to the final part. Jesus said, so when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were watching. They were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, he had called him and said unto him, Oh, you wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you desired me to. Shouldn't you also have had compassion on your fellow servant, even as I had pity on you? And his Lord was angry and delivered him to the tormentors until he should pay all that was due on him. That's a sad <coughs> example, isn't it? That man really messed up. The people watching knew he had messed up, and the Lord knew he had messed up. Being compassionate and understanding is much better than being selfish in the sight of God and in the sight of others. And when we are in disputes, I'll tell you, selfishness really has a great avenue to play in a dispute. What should our objective be in the family of God when we're caught up in a dispute of a lesser nature? Well, look at verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. We should strive to be in harmony with each other instead of saying, well, I'm just going to settle for my dispute because here I stand and I can't move. We are entrusted with the task of building each other up in the faith rather than doing what? Tearing the faith out of each other. Does that make sense for us as the family of God? Build each other up rather than tearing the faith out? I certainly think so. The key to this harmony, edification, or building up, depends on the stronger in the faith to act more compassionately toward their weaker siblings. And so you might be saying, okay, how? <clears throat> Look at verse 20. <clears throat> For meat, destroy not the work of God. As a strong believer, should I want to undermine God's work in the life of a weaker believer? And the answer, of course not. But if we move forward with our own desire to do something another believer struggles with, it could destroy what God has begun in them. And Paul's counsel is this. Never cross that line. Even if what? Even if it means you have to sacrifice your cherished freedom to do what you like. You mean, even if i got to give up Something I was counting on doing? Paul says, yes. Give it up. In order to save your weaker sibling. Give it up. Give up your freedom to do that. That's a hard thing to do in America, isn't it? Especially among Christians. In a dispute. Look again at verse 20. He says this. He goes, All things indeed are pure. <laughs> you know, and then they're like, as a strong believer, you're going, you're playing with my mind here. All things are pure. Here's a confirmation to the strong that your thoughts on the topic of meat are correct. You are correct. 
But being correct on any topic doesn't give anyone the right to trample a weaker believer, to just trample them and bulldoze them and push them down. Look again at verse 20. He says, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It's evil to trample on those who struggle with a particular issue when you're fully aware this is a great predicament to them. What's the better approach to these disputes involving gray issues? Look at verse 21. Here's a novel idea. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made me. If we as the stronger know our actions could lead to the downfall, could lead to the humiliation, could lead to the weakening of a weaker believer, then we need to choose a better path. And the better path is to deny ourselves to protect the weak. Now, remember what Jesus taught about being disciples? Oh, this one really kind of gets us. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. Follow me. Maybe this will be the cross you have to bear. Giving up your cherished freedom to help somebody out there who's in a predicament. Maybe this is the place where you've got to deny yourself and all your things you want because you know you're perfectly within your right to do it. And yet you're saying, I am putting someone else over and above what I want. Denying myself. Jesus went on to say, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. What's a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, I certainly think sacrificing our life for another person's good in God's kingdom, that's a good measure of our devotion to Jesus. Look at verse 22. This is a very interesting question. Hast thou faith? And you stop right there and you go, Paul, what do you mean? Hast thou faith? Okay, here, let me put it in our vernacular. Do you have faith in God that your thinking on this topic meets with his complete approval? Okay? The strong that Paul is addressing concerning their use of meat would probably say, I have no doubts in my mind about my conviction being correct. And I'm sure many of us can take a similar stand on certain gray issues. There's no way I'm wrong in this. I know it's right. I have full confidence in my faith in God that I'm standing in the right place. Now, his counsel to them and to us might seem a little confusing. Let's look at his answer in verse 22. Have it to thyself before God. If we know we have no doubts or concerns about a particular issue, then this doesn't mean we should brag or flaunt our understanding toward those who struggle. And I was reminded of a an example that was a story that I didn't see, it was told to me by uh, her mom. And it was a time when her mom was trying to lose some weight, and so she was not eating certain things. One of them was ice cream. And this happened before I came in the family. And so, if I remember right, your father got a bowl of ice cream. She's shaking her head because she remembers got a bowl of ice cream and sat there and he goes, oh boy, does this taste good. Wouldn't you like to have some? 
Now that was a joke, right? But we understand the principle, don't we? When somebody's struggling and we've got total freedom and how that comes across. Paul wrote, Brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh or to the sinful nature, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We have freedom in many ways as a result of God's work in us. But our freedom is not to be used selfishly. Instead, it is given to us to do what? To act responsibly. The most responsible action is to love others by serving their needs over our selfish desires. I mean, basically, love your neighbor more strongly than you do that craving for personal gain. Love your neighbor more than you do that bowl of ice cream or whatever it is. Now, what conclusions can we make about anything open to our interpretation of right and wrong. There's just two conclusions that Paul seems to make. Look again at verse 22, the first conclusion. It says, Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. We will be much happier if we don't override our conscience in whatever we do. If there is the least resistance in our mind, then we should simply avoid doing whatever we feel uncomfortable with. That's just basic sense. And when facing a choice which could hurt a weaker believer, then consider how much happier we will be in not injuring them by acting selfishly. Even though we're free to do whatever is before us, it will not be as enjoyable to us if another believer suffers as the result of our choice. That's one thought. Okay, what's the last conclusion? Look at verse 23. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat. Because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. In this example, those of a weaker position regarding this meat can't eat it freely. They're plagued by its association to idolatry. They can in good faith believe God approves of this choice in their lives. Now, when they violate their conscience and the doubts that they have, then folks, they are condemning themselves as being in the world. It's that simple. Whenever we act in contrast to what we know to be right or what we know to be in the faith, it is sin. We are teaching ourselves to defy whatever boundaries are in place in our lives for our good. We're saying, I don't care. I'm doing it anyways. And any action of defiance is sinful when it involves the inward man. As we conclude this important study, I'm reminded of this account, which is very familiar to many of us. Are you ready? And Lord, the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I don't know. Was he telling the truth? He wasn't. It was a lie. And then his next comment was this. Am I my brother's keeper? And God said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. The answer concerning a lack of responsibility for a brother 
came from a wicked man who just killed his brother. Certainly, we are our brothers and sisters keeper in the kingdom of God. We are the protectors of the weak among us. Just like we knew to be if we had younger siblings in the family we grew up in. And parents would often say, now watch out for your little brother and little sister. <coughs> Why? Because we know we are their keeper. We are their protector. And you know something that I think we've learned over time is we don't argue with the young. Think about it. We don't argue with the young. I mean, you're a full-grown adult. And this is a little child only that tall. And you're arguing with a child? What's the sense of that? What do we do? We seek to live peacefully with them. And we seek to do what? Help them grow up. That's our role as the stronger. You know, when you put this all together and start thinking about it, it's like, why am I in an argument? Why am I fighting about this? This is so foolish. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you right now, we just humbly bow knowing that this truth is, is so plain and simple to our reading of it and our thinking of it. We realize when we hear these principles and these thoughts, it's it's that, yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I understand that. But yet, how often it is that in the heat of an argument or a dispute over something that's of really no importance, how all those things kind of go out of our mind. And the temptation for pride to step in and selfishness to come is just like we've opened a door to where we should be closing the door on that stuff, with pride and selfishness, that it never has an opportunity to raise its ugly head in our lives when we're in a, a struggle with someone else, a brother or sister in the faith over something of insignificance. Help us, Father, to learn from what we've studied that going forward we might be able to exercise these things with a calmer and cooler head and mind and heart. And as we interact with one another, that we might remember that if we sense that things are getting a little out of hand, we can stop and simply reaffirm our love to one another. Saying this is the most important thing, is that we love because of Christ. We thank you, Father, for giving of your time with us this morning. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like you to turn in your hymn book to number 685. And I'd like you to really focus on, there's a couple verses in there that really caught my attention concerning this topic that we were studying. If you look there at verse 2, it says, though they lead o'er the cold, dark mountains, seeking his sheep, or along by Siloam's fountains, helping the weak. Look at verse 3. If they lead through the temple holy, preaching the word, or in homes of the poor and lowly, serving. That's a good way to re-engineer our thinking. So let's stand and let's sing this wonderful hymn, number 680.
close us in prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today's message. We thank you for the love. The reminders we have that if we have a strong faith in you and in Jesus, then we need to be loving to our neighbors and loving to those around us. And loving is to give sacrifice. And if a Christian that is weaker than we are feels that something is wrong, we shouldn't be doing those things to make their faith waver, but to give it up and stand by the, the weaker Christian and help build them up so they might get a stronger faith in you, a stronger uh, relationship with you, that they might be able to just grow in their, their relationship. We just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.